Well, good morning, everybody. Hi, welcome to this session on navigating college opportunities, focusing on study abroad, career advancement, and on-campus student activities. We hope that you're recovering from all of the manual labor that you've been doing, moving your students into their rooms. Um, please enjoy this relatively dark auditorium and stationary moment. And if you doze off, we won't be offended, we'll know why. <laughs> um, so my name is Sarah Welter, I'm Director of Study Abroad in the College. Good morning, I'm Meredith Daw, and I'm the Director of Career Advancement. Uh, and my name's Jimmy Brown. I serve as the Director for the Center for Leadership and Involvement. So again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I think I can speak for Jimmy and Meredith when I say that we're really happy to be able to talk with you together because our offices do often work in partnership as we help students identify and pursue enriching opportunities outside of the on-campus classroom. So today what we'd like to do is share a bit about resources that are available, how students access them, what programs are available to students already in this first year, and how students can think about planning for this year and the year beyond. We'll share some events that are coming up this year um, that your students can take advantage of. And I also wanted to reassure you that we are communicating all of this information to your students directly as well, multiple times. So you are not the only bearers of this information. Um, because we have three offices represented today, we're really focusing on the broader planning picture. Um, we will refer you to our websites at the end so you can find much more information about all of the different programs that we're talking about, if you wish. And I wanted to mention that during Family Weekend, which is October 25th to 27th this year, um, all of our offices will have standalone sessions where we can take a deeper dive into the nuts and bolts of our programmatic portfolios. So we certainly invite you back to campus already again um, in October and hope you can join us for those sessions as well. Um, we wanted to mention too that a recording of this session will be available on the Family Orientation website as well as the slides, so you can always refer to this information again if you wish. Um, and we should have plenty of time for your questions as well at the end, so please feel free to take some mental notes if things occur to you as we're talking. We know that this is a really busy and exciting and exhausting time for you and your students, but please know that it's an exciting time for us as well because we know that with each new incoming group of amazing students, they're going to bring their own ideas and inquisitive spirits to our program. So we're really looking forward to meeting your students and working with them in the years ahead. So for now, I'll turn things over to Meredith to talk about first year career planning. Good morning again. This is the home of career advancement. We are the office tasked with supporting your students from the very beginning. We help them identify potential career interests, help them secure opportunities, and ultimately graduate with plans in hand. So you'll be very happy to see the graphic behind me, which shows that in this past year, 96% of our graduates left the college with a plan in hand. So at the time of graduation, they had either been accepted to graduate or professional school or had secured a full-time job opportunity, which is an outstanding statistic and really a testament to their hard work and the preparation that went into helping them to succeed. When we think about our resources here at the University of Chicago, our philosophy differs from many other schools. Our planning begins on day one, and day one for your students is this coming Tuesday where all of the students have been assigned a unique career advisor based on their college application and the information that they indicated in that application. We'll be meeting with them for an hour and a half during that process. So we be believe that when you have more time, the full four years to help students develop their career plans, it works to their advantage. We also believe that having industry experts work with students plays a huge role in helping them figure out if that's an opportunity that they're excited about and ultimately how to be successful in that career path. And then finally, that experience is really what fuels post-graduation success and helping students secure as many opportunities along the way as possible. So when you think about our model, um, we begin again, as I mentioned, with the graphic on your right, which shows that every single first year student is utilizing a career advancement member and that we're supporting them throughout their first year and beyond. The traditional model, which most schools, potentially your school, followed, is that you really begin using your career services office in your junior or senior year as you approach graduation. Here, again, we just believe in beginning sooner. What we also find is that this translates to about a quarter of the class already having plans secured by the beginning of their senior year. So that's something else to keep in mind. 
So I mentioned this Tuesday and that we'll be working with your students and I wanted to show you a graphic that they'll see on a brochure that we provide to them, which is their first year roadmap. And it just talks to them about all the opportunities they have available to them in their first year at the University of Chicago. Um, these opportunities are meant to be non-selective, so if students want to participate on a track or a job shining opportunity, we make sure that we meet the demand and that they get that opportunity. We also make sure that students write their very first um, career resume. We know that students are starting at different places and we want to be able to help them translate a high school portfolio or a high school resume into a college level resume. This also ensures that students are ready to go out of the gate if they want to apply for a research opportunity or an internship or a work study job, they have the resume in hand. Um, when you think about the resources that we have for students in terms of students that are exploring, that don't have a path uh, in mind, which quite honestly are the students we're most excited about working with. This is a great liberal arts college and we will help them um, determine what might be the best path forward and versus students who are specializing. Is we have a lot of resources available in both camps and I just wanted to highlight how we think about students who need more generalist advising from the very beginning versus students who want to specialize and then we can do a deeper dive in that area. When we think about students wanting to specialize more and over time and their four years here, they are gonna to wanna to get that deeper level of expertise. We have a suite of services that meet their needs. These programs are called UChicago Careers and Programs and we have them in eight different disciplines, everything from business to health professions to STEM. And essentially they're partnerships with our graduate professional schools where students can take graduate level courses at those professional graduate schools on campus they get a, a mentor who's a graduate professional school student, and they have an industry advisor here. And these are not part-time advisors. These are full-time members of our staff who work for a significant period of time in that field and are a member of our team supporting your students in their journey. What we have found is that these students provide a great a career community as students are thinking about the field and wanting to do more research um, to be prepared for opportunities. And then here, when we think about experiences being the key to success, I mentioned that in the first year, we try to seed as many opportunities for first year students as possible. So students don't have to feel that they're competing against their peers for opportunities to go on a track or, or have an externship. So those opportunities, job shadowing tracks, are available to all first year students. And then we build on there. So once students have an opportunity, that can translate to the next opportunity, which can be the form of a very short term um, internship or a fuller internship, which lasts about 10 weeks, student employment potentially on campus, then ultimately successful outcomes. But we all know that usually you have to have experience to get experience. So that's what we're trying to do with these um, opportunities in the, that are non-competitive, is just giving the students the advantage of getting some experience. One great way that students love to do that is through job shadowing. We offer job shadowing throughout the year, but the two most popular times are over winter break and spring break. Students can shadow alumni, parents, if you'd be willing to host a student at your place of work, or one of our employers. And this is just a great way for students to see professional work environment and learn more about the field. Ultimately, these opportunities are also great for networking because often they can translate into an internship for the next summer. And our most popular program for students is our TREK program. This is a program where we essentially do off-campus recruiting. We bring groups of 25 students to cities around the world where we spend uh, several days getting a deeper dive into industries within that city. So for example, when we go to Boston, we can either do a deeper dive in consulting or potentially healthcare or tech. When we go to Dubai, it could be about sustainability and the service economy. Uh, when we've gone to um, London, we've focused there on journalism and arts and media. We've also done a business trek to London. So these are all opportunities where students are getting to see a different city and getting to know an industry there as well. Ultimately, these experiences do lead to internships and full-time job opportunities because we send a resume book ahead of time and employers can read the resume book and identify students that they might want to connect with while they're there at their organization. It really makes a low barrier for employers to work with us since we bring the students to them. 
And then I included some sample Trek itineraries. These are real Treks that we held this past year just to showcase what students do day to day. Essentially, we're meeting with about four employers per day, and then the evening either attending a reception with our alumni and parents and employers or having a cultural activity. These experiences um, are paid for, for the most part, by Career Advancement. We cover their hotel, their ground transportation, and all of their food. Um, all students on aid get airfare covered, and then in many cases, the destinations we have also cover airfare for all students. So for example, um, we go to Seoul, uh, South Korea every year, and that trip is completely paid for um, for students, including their airfare. So all of this information is on our site, but I just wanted to highlight that since it's such a great opportunity. And then once students are building these experiences, getting an idea of what they might want to pursue, our most popular program in terms of internships is the Jeff Metcalf program. Um, it was started over 20 years ago, and all of the opportunities in this portfolio program are paid and substantive and in every single discipline that you could imagine. So you could be working at the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, you could be at Google and Mountain View, you could be working for um, at the US Commercial Services part of the embassy in Moscow. These are all air areas that students can and have pursued during the summer and academic uh, months. So this past year, we had uh, 2,800 opportunities. This year, we'll have over 3,000 paid Metcalf opportunities. And as you can see from the breadth of our um, offering across the world, we're in about 250 cities. If a student doesn't find what they're looking through through the Metcalf program, um, we also have grants available, so a student can design their own internship experience, and then we can fund that for them to either have an opportunity in the United States or to go abroad for the opportunity. And then a smaller version of the Metcalf program, which isn't 10 weeks in nature, is our micro Metcalf program. And it's an opportunity for students to be studying abroad, and they, if they would like to have a, a stint for a, about 10 hours a week, for example, working remotely, for Amazon while they're studying abroad in Paris, they can do that. Or here in their dorm room, if they're looking for just a short-term kind of gig opportunity, this is all managed by the Career Advancement Office as well. And students love it because sometimes they have um, a month or two where they just would like to get some relevant, valuable, paid experience, and this is a way for us to tap them into those opportunities. Finally, the other component of what we do here at Career Advancement is student employment. And student employment is any job opportunity on campus. So we have many students who are doing research or working at our library or working at our athletic facilities. We manage all of those opportunities and they're posted on Handshake. And Handshake is our system for applying to any opportunity within career advancement from a track to student employment to a full-time job. And it's also the way that students can make an appointment with us. It's through their CNET ID and password, so there's no uh, difficulty for students to access the system at any time. The great thing about Handshake is it also suggests things that students might not be aware of based on their previous applications or things that they're clicking on. So if a student's really, really targeting Latin America, for example, with some of the opportunities they're applying to, it will suggest to them that we have an upcoming track to Latin America and they should consider that. So it really drives the customer experience. All of that culminates with um, our students graduating uh, with jobs. About 80% of the students um, who leave with a plan in hand go directly into full-time employment. And these are some of our largest employers that work with us. You can see that it really runs the gamut. We're the largest employer for the CIA's uh, analytical area of uh, NISA. And we're one of the top employers for the NSA and State Department, so huge federal branch. Uh, job opportunities, Teach for America, Accenture replaced 44 students just this past year. So really have a lot of um, placement at large uh, institutions and small and mid-sized firms as well. And then I wanted to share um, kind of what our top professional school destinations are. So this information is taken from our exit survey. Um, the law school and medical school advising is housed here in career advancement as well. And these were our top uh, law schools and medical schools from this past year in alphabetical order. And then for graduate schools, and that would be academic masters or PhD programs, these were the top destinations from 2019. So a very impressive list. And 
We also just want to say that parents can make a difference if you are interested in hiring an intern or someone to join your full-time recruiting class or hosting a student for a day for an externship. We'd love to work with you. It just really opens um, the world of work to our students. And with that, I will turn it over to Sarah to talk about study abroad. Thank you, Meredith. So hello again. Um, so I first came to the University of Chicago back in 2002 to do a master's in French. Um, and I then took some time and did some teaching in the community colleges. I worked for a competitor university on the north side, uh, rhymes with Schmorschwestern. And then I was really you know, thrilled to come back to the University of Chicago and work in this particular field. Because as an undergraduate, I spent a year abroad studying in France. It was my first time ever leaving the country. I remember when I arrived at Charles de Gaulle Airport and took the shuttle from one terminal to the next, even the trash on the side of the road was interesting to me. So needless to say, this was a really impactful experience for me, and it's incredibly rewarding to be able to work at this particular place and help our students forge their own international experiences. So today I really wanted to just give you a snapshot of study abroad participation in the college, let you know how we're familiarizing students with our programs, and helping them make a plan so that they can identify a program that meets their interests and also works with their academic timeline. We're thrilled that so many students here in the college do choose to participate in study abroad. About half of all undergraduates will study abroad at least once before they graduate, which is pretty high for an institution of our profile. Many of our competitors, it's much closer to 10 to 12%. And we think that the reason that so many students elect to participate in these programs is because we've been able to develop a suite of programs that really are an extension of the undergraduate curriculum and reflect the reasons that students came to the college in the first place. We know that all of these 12 quarters are very precious. Students have worked hard to get here. They guard this time jealously. So the fact that we can offer them an experience that really resonates with the experience that they sought here, I think has been something that's been compelling for our students. We want these programs to be seamless for students, and that carries over to registration and financial aid. So when students participate in study abroad through the college, they stay enrolled here in the college. That means all of their courses, credits, and grades automatically appear on their transcripts, and financial aid eligibility is retained. So the way this works is that tuition is exactly the same as if a student were here on campus. Students are not paying on-campus room and board or student activity fees. In place of that, they pay a program fee, and those are all listed on our website, and that covers essentially the room and board and activities of the study abroad program. And that, just like on-campus room and board and fees, are, is eligible for coverage by financial aid. We also have additional funding for Odyssey scholars to help with out-of-pocket expenses. So our goal really is to make all of these programs both academically and financially accessible to all undergraduate students in the college. We have a diverse range of programs. We now have 66 programs in 22 different countries, so that's 32 cities um, in Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. You are now all experts in the undergraduate curriculum, so you're certainly familiar with the Civilization Studies core requirement. And some of our most popular study abroad programs are the Civ Abroad sequences. So the idea behind these programs is that instead of students completing, say, a three-quarter sequence of civilization studies here on campus, they take the entire year's worth of civ requirement abroad, compressed into one quarter, taught by University of Chicago faculty who are expert in that particular region, and then they also take a language course alongside. So the idea is really to wed that traditional academic experience of the University of Chicago with direct experience of a culture taught by faculty who are experts in that particular location. In addition to the CIV programs, our faculty teach a lot of other programs focusing on different disciplines in the humanities, the social sciences, um, physical, biological sciences. So we have an advanced math program in Paris. We have human rights in Vienna. There's a public policy program in Barcelona. This winter, we're launching a new econ major program in Hong Kong that features internships um, supported by Meredith's office. So we're constantly working with our faculty to develop new programs to help students students not only complete core requirements, but also work toward major or minor requirements in international destinations. And then in addition to those faculty-led programs, we do offer the more traditional you know, junior year abroad type exchange or direct enrollment programs, where students can spend up to an academic year studying at one of our partner institutions and taking courses that will, again, contribute back to their graduation requirements. So lots of different opportunities, depending on the type of program and location that a student is interested in. Yeah. <laughs> 
In addition to those academic study abroad opportunities that we offer, we also sponsor a suite of summer international travel grants. So these are grants of $5,000 to you know, support students either intensive language study or research abroad during the summer. And I think what's really nice about these grants is that they're entirely flexible. So students put together a proposal for a language um, experience or a research project that they're interested in undertaking. It's evaluated by a committee, and we're able to award approximately 100 of these grants every year, and that's about 50% of the applications that we receive. Increasingly, we're seeing a lot of applications from students who are completing their first year, so it's a great thing that we're talking to students already in their first year to think about to really make the most of that first summer. One of the most common questions that comes up about study abroad is timing. So when's the best time to study abroad? And you know, there really isn't a one-size-fits-all answer because, as I've mentioned, we have lots of different possibilities. And of course, our, our student paths are very individualized. I can tell you that about 67% of our students study abroad in their third year. So third year is still the most popular. But we do have some very enterprising first year students who will study abroad during their spring quarter. And we have some students who might wait until spring quarter of their fourth year, and then they can still come back to campus and graduate in time with their class. So our conversations about timing are quite individualized. But I think the important message that we want to convey is that students of all majors, including pre-meds, can study abroad and graduate on time with early planning. So how to go about that all important early planning. Um, in their first year, we really encourage students to be talking with their college academic advisor about their academic goals, activities that they want to be involved here on campus. And if they're interested in study abroad, certainly mention that. And together, they can kind of you know, map in where study abroad might best fit. We are holding a number of different um, orientation week sessions for students that we're, you know, talking through all of different programs and the application process. In November, we have additional information sessions um, where they can talk with program coordinators in our office. Um, I think the important thing to remember is that for most programs, students are applying the year in advance. So if your student is someone who really wants to study abroad second year, this would be the year to apply. So it's helpful for them to begin thinking about these opportunities and talking with us so we can really help them map out a timeline. We also, I wanted to mention, have a fun student fair in January that's run by our student advisory committee. So students have been on these programs, come back, and they bring food and photos and staff tables. And it's an opportunity for students to really you know, get a day in the life experience and talk with their peers who have participated. And of course, they can come to our office and meet with us anytime. And we're happy to answer any questions that they have. So you know, I hope the, the key takeaway is that we have a diverse range range of programs to really meet the diverse interests of our students and we're you know ready to begin working with them beginning in the first year to help identify an opportunity that's of interest. So happy to take your questions later but for now I'll turn things over to Jimmy to talk about ways that his office is supporting student success back here on campus. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, so yes, our students enter campus and immediately want to try to get involved. Uh, and that's where my office comes in. So we highly encourage the students to look into one of the 400 plus or student organizations that we currently have on campus. I think the number is at 418 right now. Um, the website that you see up there, blueprint.uchicago.edu, that is our online directory for all of those RSOs. And so you all, as parents, can uh, go to the website. It is a publicly accessible website. Um, but with a CNET ID, your students can log in and get additional information, primary contact, and, and see a little bit of like what each of those student organizations do. Um, a fun feature at UChicago is that each of our student organizations are staff advised. And so a member of my team works directly with these student organizations to make sure that they are kind of uh, using the best practices in terms of engaging our students. They're engaging in some leadership development and thinking critically around what it is that they're trying to do on campus. Um, we also work with student government. And so if your student is interested or has participated in student government in the past, um, the way our college council is organized is that there are four representatives of each graduating class of the college. Um, the other three classes have already elected their representatives. They do that in spring quarter. Um, but uh, however, we hold the election for the fall for you all. And so uh, petitions be uh, released on Wednesday, I do believe. Uh, they have to get a certain number of signatures. I believe it's 35 signatures from their uh, colleagues and, and uh, co-students. And then elections are held at the second week of the quarter. And then they start right off the bat, third week, uh, in their meetings with student government. We also have a host of competitive academic teams. So our model United Nations team continues to be number one in the nation. 
Um, we have a traveling college competitive team, but we also have a Model UN team that works directly on kind of teaching Model UN skills to high schoolers. And so we host one of the larger national uh, competitions for Model UN high school. Uh, and those are all completely student run. We invite somewhere around 3,000 uh, high schoolers from around the world nowadays um, for a four day conference downtown at a hotel in Chicago. Um, so that is a completely student run endeavor. Um, I work directly with them, as you can imagine, the risk that might be involved with that. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun, but these students are probably some of the, the most um, detail oriented and responsible students that I've ever worked with. Uh, we also have about 40 sports clubs, so if your student is not a varsity level athlete but wants to stay active, um, we have 40 club sports which are still highly competitive and do travel to compete. Um, and then a, a whole host of individual and group intramurals that your, that your student can join through athletics. Um, 60 groups or so are involved in community service. Um, and that is everything from food deserts to homelessness to uh, education. And so if you are interested in getting involved in the local or Chicagoland community, there's lots of opportunities for that um, that they can get involved with through the student organizations. Of course, we have the traditional acapella and the dance groups. Um, they will see a lot of those featured this week during their orientation activities. The Friday of this week, there's the Reynolds Club party. Um, where we'll actually highlight Off Off Campus, which is um, one of our main improv organizations. Um, fun fact, the members of Off Off are some of the original founders of what is now called Second City here in the, in the city. So um, you may have heard of that. Uh, we, cultural, uh, religious organizations, there's about 40 uh, cultural and ethnic organizations on campus, about the same number of different religious organizations that they can get involved in. Um, and then if all of those things are uh, not what the student is looking for, there are, of course, opportunities to start their own organization. Um, we see about 40 new groups start every year. Um, it's a completely student-run process, so we have about 80 applications for new organizations, but as you may know from your, from your students, they are highly critical of one another, and so they really only accept about 40 organizations um, to start back every year. So it's kind of a fun process that the, that the students run on their own. Uh, as I mentioned, we also focus on leadership development. Um, obviously, you cannot walk into these organizations and know how to run a team or lead a meeting or inspire or motivate your peers to actually do something. And so we try to help them through those developmental processes by hosting a variety of workshops and, and other opportunities for them to develop their leadership skills. Um, we are a strengths-based campus, um, which I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Um, and so part of that is, providing workshops every quarter that help students think about how do they use their leadership strengths, which might be very different from the person sitting beside you, um, to help kind of build a team, um, understand how to communicate effectively, and then uh, the ever important conflict management. Um, as their students are sitting through right now a session on freedom of expression, um, obviously a very hot topic nationally and, and a priority and definitely a um, principle of the UChicago kind of experience. Um, thinking about how do you use your strengths to engage uh, kind of constructively in conflict management and to be able to kind of communicate in those periods of difficult triggering emotional states. Um, we also host a variety of kind of standard leadership programs. So we have our Student Leadership Institute, which is a very focused bi-weekly workshop series that happens in the winter and spring quarter. Applications come out this fall, they come out next week. Um, it's a project-based program, and so students are put into teams of six to eight students. They have to propose a project that would they, they would consider improving campus, and then we fund those projects. Um, a little bit of venture capitalism at work. And then the students are responsible for bringing those projects to bear um, with moderate levels of success. Uh, so, but it's a big learning environment in terms of how do you uh, delegate, motivate a team, and then actually bring a plan into action, which is not as easy as, as some of our students think it is. Um, we host a quarterly overnight retreat, which is focused on building inclusive communities. Um, how do you build a highly uh, per high performance multicultural team? Um, and part of that is recognizing uh, your social identities and the social identities of the team members that you have around you. And what does that mean for when you are kind of bringing your leadership strengths to bear? Uh, and then we host a quarterly book club. 
um, that's focused specifically on uh, women in leadership roles. And so we work with a faculty member to select the book. Um, we give out the book to anyone who is interested and then invite the students and faculty and, and frankly any campus community member um, to join us for a free lunch that we provide where uh, the faculty member leads us in a discussion of the particular book that we read. Um, that's always announced about eighth week of the quarter for what the book will be for the next quarter's read. Um, it's been a, a very popular program that our office has led. So I'd mentioned that we are a strengths-based campus, and what that means is um, all of our leadership programs are focused on what are the leadership kind of aspects that you already bring to bear um, that you are drawn to, that motivate you, that you are good at. Um, we do not lead our programs talking about the things that students um, are deficit uh, at or need to develop. Um, and part of that is using Gallup's uh, Clifton Strengths Finder. Um, Strengths Finder, Strengths Quest, you may have heard it called a variety of things, um, but is an online leadership assessment that we provide to every student of the college. Um, your students will be getting their access code at the end of orientation. They're getting a lot of information thrown at them this week, and so we try to hold off um, for sending yet another email to them. Um, but we provide a code to every student to get online and take it. This is in conjunction with Meredith's team in career advancement. And so uh, students go online, they take the assessment at their own pace. Um, it gives them what they, uh, what Gallup considers to be their top five leadership talents. Um, and then a lot of students say like, well, what next? And so we host a variety of workshops every quarter. Um, we work with their college academic advisors, we work with their career advisors, um, so that when they are meeting with those staff members, if they are curious about how do they bring these leadership st uh, strengths to bear, either in their career search or thinking about internship opportunities, or if they're developing their resume and trying to think about how they want to highlight a particular experience that they have on campus, um, we look to uh, the Strengths Quest language to kind of provide some of that base material. And then finally, I just want to wrap up with um, some of our uh, highlights, programs, traditions that we would encourage your students to attend, um, but also you might want to think about you know, checking in on over the course of the year to see if they are actually getting outside of the reg and, and appreciating some of campus life. Um, so first is uh, on Thursday of this week, your students will get invited to the Blueprint. Um, named so because of that online directory that I mentioned earlier, which is an opportunity for the students to engage with student government and some of our RSOs on campus, um, but also our peer advisors. We hire a team of students to work with uh, students in the college to kind of find those involvement opportunities. You kind of know you're interested in something, but you don't really know which avenue you want to take. Um, you work with one of our peer advisors to kind of lead you in a particular direction. Um, we also host the Student Activities and Resource Fair at the Friday of first week. Um, it is a much larger version of the resource fair that you all walked through yesterday. Um, so imagine uh, the main quad filled with about 400 tables um, for departments and student organizations where the, your student will get to spend the, the afternoon walking around, signing up for email groups, taking some free candy, taking some free giveaways, and just kind of getting a taste for what are those variety of uh, involvement opportunities that are available to them. Uh, in January, when the weather is a bit less uh, kind of amenable here in Chicago, um, one of our largest student organizations hosts a, a campus tradition known as Cuvia, um, which as crazy as it may sound, is actually a very popular event on campus where for the second week of the quarter in January, um, students wake up 6 a.m. every morning. Uh, they go to Henry Crown Fieldhouse and they do uh, some morning calisthenics and yoga, uh, and then they take a class, uh, an athletic class taught by one of our student organizations. So it could be yoga, it could be one of our dance classes, kind of getting your body moving at 6 a.m. That goes through the week, and then on the Friday of that week, uh, they actually, instead of meeting at Henry Crown, they go out to Promontory Point out at Lake Michigan. Um, and they watch the sunrise while they are doing um, the Salute to the Sun, which is the, the stretching program that they do every morning. So they prepare, they learn the routine Monday through Thursday, and then Friday morning they wear multiple layers um, <laughs> and uh, go out to the lake. Um, we do have some brave students who, so you may want to talk to your, to your student, um, who do the, um, what we can only call the polar bear dip. Um, where they decide to get into the lake that Friday morning. Um, don't worry, we have EMS and other staff on hand just in case, um, but it is a tradition that happens on campus. And then in the spring quarter, uh, you may have heard of a thing called SCAV, 
Um, that's our annual scavenger hunt, which is student run. Um, it did held, it held the title for many years as the largest scavenger hunt in the world. Um, that's actually no longer the case. They've, they've, they've kind of rolled it back a little bit, which is really uh, nice for us. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, is a, it is held over Mother's Day weekend and the week leading up to Mother's Day. Um, students develop a list of about 400 items. That's everything from creative writing to build this thing to find this thing. Um, there is a road trip component. Um, there's a SCAV Olympics that is involved. Uh, your houses will kind of build a team. There's hundreds of students that participate in this every year. Uh, and it's always a very unique opportunity for the campus to see just how creative our students might be. Um, in fact, one of the, the kind of historical moments in SCAB that you may have heard of is that students actually built a working nuclear reactor in their dorm room um, many years ago. Um, it, it, they, they were able to, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, create like a very trace amount of, I think, uranium of some sort. Um, so, hey, like that's a pretty amazing feat, I think, for our students to be able to do in their dorm rooms. We do not allow those items any longer on the list, I'm just going to say. Uh, there, it's, it, it is another one of the groups that I directly <laughs> advise um, so, so we can uh, review all of those items in advance. Um, you may have seen, if you go on the SCAV website, you'll see tons of pictures from things in the past. They have gone as far as bringing live tigers onto campus. Um, the rockets have been involved. Uh, people have taken out their appendixes for the scavenger hunt list. It is a very, it is a very unique and uh, diverse uh, list of things that students participate in. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. Um, we will be here uh, for, I think we have a little bit of time before your next session, so I'm happy to take some questions from hands.